Good evening. I'm Mike Minones. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of the Houston Methodist uh, Debating Cardiovascular Journal. This is our first webcast uh, related to uh, articles presented in the journals. And in the September issue, uh, we dedicated that issue to review articles on the topic of nutritional supplements and the heart. The reason why we selected that topic is because it's of great importance to both physicians and patients. Turns out that over three quarters of adults in the U.S. report taking nutritional supplements. In 2018, U.S. consumers spent over $42 billion on supplements and that's expected to increase. People use supplements hoping that they will help them for um, reducing risk of diseases, improving uh, health, particularly in the area of the heart and cardiovascular health. In the past, it was difficult to know much about the benefits of the supplements because there were not that many studies. They are not controlled by the FDA. But more recently, there have been some trials that have been randomized and have given us more light as to the benefits, harm, or no effect of some of the supplements. Um, I'm joined today by the two guest editors for the issue in September, uh, Dr. John Cook, who is the chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences and director of the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration at Houston Methodist, and Dr. Albert Reisner, who is a very senior interventional cardiologist, one of the pioneers in the development of techniques by catheter to uh, open arteries and do things that today are considered routine. And he's also vice chair of the Department of Cardiology at Houston Methodist. There are many of these supplements available. So today we're only going to discuss the ones that are overall used the most. Multivitamins, coenzyme Q10, omega-3 fatty acids, red yeast rice, and inorganic nitrates. Before we start the discussion, I'd like to uh, mention to all of you that at the end we're going to have a period of question and answers. And as you listen to the presentations, if you have any questions to submit, you can submit them by texting DBAKEY to 37607. And once you do that, it will prompt you to a place where you can then ask any questions that you like. So without any further delay, I turn over to my good friend, Dr. Reisner, to talk to us a little bit about multivitamins and coenzyme Q10. Okay. Th uh, thank you, Mike. We're going to focus for the next few minutes on vitamins and minerals, something that we're all familiar with. Uh, these are substances which are essential to the body, but cannot be produced by the body. Uh, deficiencies of vitamins and minerals are associated with known disease, the classic uh, uh, being uh, scurvy found in the sailors, uh, British ships several centuries ago, corrected by uh, vitamin C that was in uh, lemons, uh, but now we know there are a variety, many deficient syndromes of uh, vitamins. The question here is, in the absence of a deficiency, is supplementation associated with a health benefit? Dr. Quinone has mentioned that a huge percentage of the population are taking right or wrong vitamins and minerals. So we'll look at uh, several of these items and some of the studies that have gone into our current assessment. Uh, we tend to think that there's not much study behind these, but the reality is that there's a plethora of trials, some very good trials, looking at these. For example, in the area of multivitamins and multiminerals, Physicians Health Study was a 14,000 uh, subject study, and it's randomized, it's placebo controlled, and after 11 years of follow-up, the conclusion was there's no substantive health benefit or cardiovascular benefit to multivitamins and multiminerals. The Nurses Health Study uh, was more a registry, very large scale, still ongoing, and there was a suggestion of decreased coronary artery disease 
but numerous additional studies failed to support that. And in fact, if one looks at a meta-analysis of the large number of uh, studies, the bottom line is that there's no clear-cut health benefit to multivitamins, multiminerals. Antioxidants, another subcategory, one large uh, study at least, uh, the Sue V. Max, a French study of 13,000 individuals showed no benefit. And once again, meta-analysis, no benefit. Folic acid, uh, not infrequently prescribed by physicians based on the fact that uh, high homocysteine levels are associated with increased vascular disease and folic acid can lower homocysteine levels. But when one looks at the data, the aspirin folate polyp prevention trial wasn't only looking at polyps, but at other health <laughs> benefits, uh, found no benefit despite the fact that it was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. There was one trial, a China stroke prevention trial of 20,000 individuals that did show a reduction in stroke, but the improvement was in mostly in individuals with low folate levels. Maybe these were deficient rather than supplemented. Vitamin E, again, a, a large number of trials, uh, including the VMAX and the HOPE trial. The HOPE trial is important in that it was a large scale, it was well designed, uh, showed vitamin E versus placebo in a, a group of uh, individuals. And the bottom line is that there was no uh, substantive uh, benefit. Niacin is another drug that we often uh, will utilize. Uh, in a very early study, the Coronary Drug Project, late mortality at 15 years seemed to be improved. And this led to a lot of interest in niacin. We know that niacin can raise the HDL level. Theoretically, that should be a benefit. But subsequent trials, more common, more uh, uh, up to date, the AIM High and the Heart Protection Study in the era of statins showed that there was no benefit to niacin in uh, patients who were using statins concomitantly. So the takeaway message from uh, this plethora of data is that exogenous supplements of vitamins and minerals in, in individuals without a deficiency have shown no cardiovascular benefit. So much so that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, group of uh, experts in the field who periodically review the literature, have concluded that there is insufficient evidence, is the term that they use, to recommend these uh, uh, chemicals. In fact, some have harmful effects. Beta carotene in a high risk cancer group of smokers had an increased incidence of lung cancer. Vitamin E, we know, has potential for bleeding uh, in, in some individuals. And niacin has a uh, a potential, uh, aside from side effects, for liver injury, uh, among other things. So let's go on to CoQ10. Uh, CoQ10 is a cofactor for mitochondrial enzyme uh, complexes that are involved in the production of ATP. So it's an, an essential ingredient in energy production in cells. It's present in all tissues and the highest concentrations are seen in metabolically active tissues, heart, muscle, uh, and uh, uh, liver, kidney. It's synthesized by the body, but tends to decline with age. So where do we find its use potential in, uh, in cardiovascular? Well, in the syndrome of SAMS, what is SAMS? Statin-associated muscle symptoms. These are individuals with muscle pains, cramps, weakness, who, who, in whom it is thought to be caused by statin. Statin 
reduced levels of CoQ10 in blood and tissues because the statins affect the uh, pathways. The beneficial effect of this uh, pathway inhibition is to uh, reduce cholesterol, but as a, uh, uh, a uh, an innocent bystander effect, other compounds such as CoQ10 are affected and their and, and their levels reduced. So the evidence for effectiveness of CoQ10 in SAMs, first cardiologists, it's often prescribed by cardiologists, more so on anecdotal. Uh, uh, reasons of patients that benefited from the addition. Of, so could uh, could 10,000 cardiologists be wrong? Probably not. Second, there are tr many trials of CoQ10, but the trial results are conflicting. Some were very positive, some were very negative. But when one has this kind of uh, uh, differences in trial results, a meta-analysis is usually very important. And the meta-analysis by Q et al, published in the Journal of the American Heart Association, uh, took, was very critical in the studies that they analyzed. And what they showed is that symptoms like uh, uh, cramps, muscle, pain, weakness, and uh, uh, tenderness of muscles were significantly reduced if one does a meta-analysis. So what is the uh, recommendation as far as uh, the CoQ10 in another area in which muscle plays an important role, and that's in heart failure. Patients with congestive heart failure have a measurable deficiency of CoQ10. There have been numerous small trials which have shown a benefit, but no large randomized trial. The largest and most recent is called the QSYMBIO trial. This is 420 patients. Uh, at two years, there was a very substantial 43% reduction in the uh, in MACE, death hospitalization, or use of, uh, uh, of VADs, and improvement in New York Heart Association class. In addition, ejection fraction improved in patients who's had more mild forms of heart failure, ejection fractions greater than uh, 30%. So what could we offer as recommendations based on a fairly objective review of the uh, literature? Number one, in patients with SAMs, if one is anticipating using CoQ10, it's first important to establish the diagnosis of SAMs, either by resolution of symptoms off statin, particularly if they recur on a statin, and many patients will have gone through many statins with the same uh, problem. And then a trial of CoQ10 is, is warranted based on the available literature. And often we will d introduce CoQ10 with a lower starting dose of statin. In patients with congestive heart failure, it is not acceptable as a first line treatment. The standard uh, therapy of beta blockers, after load reducing drugs, and spironolactone are clearly the uh, fundamental treatments for congestive heart failure. But CoQ10 can be considered as an add-on therapy, particularly in patients with more modest forms of left ventricular disease. Thank you, Al. Um, I must admit that uh, before we published that, uh, this supplement uh, that was edited by Dr. Cook and Dr. Reisner, um, personally, I didn't have that much knowledge about any of these nutrients. So I have had a lot of fun reading the articles and preparing for this webcast. And I suspect that many clinicians uh, are probably like me. You know, we, we hear about them, but we haven't had the time to really learn a lot about them. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about two supplements that have been used to try to reduce cholesterol, um, fish oils, 
and red yeast rice. Fish oils lower primarily triglycerides, which is one of the components of cholesterol, and to some degree, the so-called non-HDL cholesterol, whereas red yeast rice lowers mostly LDL cholesterol. Why people would take them? Well, again, they would take them hoping that this will reduce not only their cholesterol, but the risk for cardiovascular events. When we talk about CV events, we mean heart attacks, death from heart conditions, strokes, uh, and also need for procedures such as bypass surgery, coronary stents, etc. We know that this vascular disease comes from something we call atherosclerosis, development of plaques. They can happen in any artery in the body, but inside the coronary arteries, we call it coronary artery disease, and that leads eventually to symptoms, chest pain, as well as uh, heart attacks or death. There are multiple risk factors for this that you can see in this slide, from genetics to aging to a lot of environmental factors such as smoking, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, becoming obese, sedentary life, and so on. Of, of all of them, cholesterol levels have become very important and have been shown to be a very important risk factors. And frequently, these risk factors are combined. They, they come in companies. So you have high cholesterol with high blood pressure, with obesity, diabetes, and so on. Now, when we talk about cholesterol, uh, it's, it's a family of different components. And this is mostly for the lay, lay public uh, watching the, uh, the webcast. But cholesterol is not just one thing. It's a combination of different um, components. LDL, or low-density lipoproteins, uh, we call it bad cholesterol. So this is fat traveling in a certain type of protein called lipoprotein. And frequently, these are very small particles. And the higher the levels, the worse the potential for uh, bad events, and thus the lower the levels, the better. In contrast, HDL, or high-density lipoprotein, has been called the good cholesterol because people who have high levels of uh, HDL tend to have less disease. However, this usually comes in people's genes. So genetics are the most important uh, player in this, and there's not much that, from an environmental point of view, people can do other than exercise, which can raise a little bit the HDL. Triglycerides are very important. It's another way that fat travels in the blood. The fat is broken into three fatty acids mixed with a glycerol ester, and that allows it to be soluble. But once again, the higher the levels, the more bad things that can happen, in part because for a given level of LDL, higher triglycerides produce more damage because you get more, even more smaller particles of the LDL. This is very influenced by diet, obesity, diabetes. They all frequently, these kind of people who are who eat uh, poorly and are obese, they frequently have very high triglycerides, although genes can also play a role. More recently, we talk about the non-HDL cholesterol, and that has become very popular. Why? Because it's total cholesterol minus the good guy. So you're left with all the bad stuff. And uh, nowadays, again, the lower the better. Uh, we pre prefer to have something under 130 milligrams per uh, deciliter. Now, why is cholesterol so important? Because it's been shown very, very well that high cholesterol levels are associated with disease. And when you lower LDL, you get less events. This slide has been shown in many conferences uh, uh, in the world. Uh, it's from a publication in 2005. And these were uh, four major clinical trials in the days that one could do placebo and treatment. And you can see for each of these uh, trials, red being placebo, yellow being treated group with statins, how as LDL came down, the event rates for cardiovascular events went down. And it's basically an inverse linear relation. Very powerful, showing very clearly that the lower we can bring LDL, the more reduction in events. So that takes us to the uh, nutrients. So we have omega-3 fatty acids. They're found naturally in fish oil salmon, herring, anchovies, sardines, rainbow trout, and a few other things that are not listed here. And it's been clearly shown that populations that consume large quantity of uh, this type of fish have lower incidence of coronary artery disease. Currently, we recommend one to two servings per week. So we can extract these long-chain omega-3 fatty acids and put them in a pill. 
So they're currently available as a supplement and also as prescription preparations, as we'll show you in a minute. Most of these preparations have a combination of two of these long-term, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, icosa pentaenoic acid, or EPA, which I prefer to say, uh, docosa hexaenoic acid, or DHA. Now, clearly they reduce triglycerides, and to a lesser extent, the non-HDL cholesterol. Some preparations, as we'll show you in a minute, can reduce cardiovascular events. However, the composition of uh, the preparations is very important. And clinical trials that have higher amounts of EPA and DHA have had the more positive effects. Also, the effects are greater in patients that already have a baseline elevation of triglycerides in groups with low fish consumption and in those who are also taking a statin. So frequently we use uh, 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 these uh, supplements in top of a statin. I'm showing you here three important trials that were published in 2018. ASCEN was done in the United Kingdom with over 15,000 diabetic patients using 840 milligrams of EPA and DHA and it was a negative trial in, the, in, in terms of the composite endpoint that they chose to look at, which was a combination of non-fatal heart attacks, vascular death, strokes, transient ischemic attacks. Combined, there was no significant effect. However, there was an important signal in the trial. Vascular death was reduced by 19%. Vital was done in the United States with close to 26,000 healthy adults, elderly adults, no history of disease. Again, they use 840 milligrams of EPA and DHA. And once again, the composite endpoint of strokes and cardiovascular deaths was not affected. But important signals were seen. Heart attacks were reduced by 28%, and total cardio a coronary heart disease events by 17%. The most important trial just recently published was Reduced IT, an international trial with over 8,000 patients, high-risk patients. These patients were already taking a statin. So they were randomized in top of a statin to have a fish oil preparation of um, um, a particular preparation that is mostly a new type of EPA. And in this trial with 3.6 grams of this uh, preparation, there was a very significant reduction, 26% um, reduction in the combined endpoint, which consisted of a combination of cardiovascular death, non-fatal heart attacks, strokes, need for bypass surgery, or unstable angina. Um, in fact, this trial was so, pow so powerful that today it's the trial that has shown the greatest reduction in events when anything else is added to a statin. No other product, medication added to a statin have had as powerful a reduction in events as this trial has been. However, very importantly, the patients were patients also with a baseline elevation of triglycerides over 135 um, milligrams per uh, deciliter. So take home message. General healthy populations. Recommendations, eat fish. Tastes well, good. One to two servings per week. Now, if you don't like fish, um, and you're still concerned about your risk because of perhaps some family history and so on, then you might want to consume uh, one gram per day of a combination that has at least one gram per of EPA and one gram of DHA. Now, for patients that are in significant high risk groups and with elevated triglycerides, then a high amount of fish oils will be recommended, four grams per day of EPA. Um, with or without a statin, but preferably with a statin. 
to mimic the, re the results of the reduced trial. Now, the preparation that was used in the reduced trial is a prescription preparation. It's sold as Vasepa, and unfortunately today, because it is a new drug, it's very expensive. So if you cannot afford it, then the best one can do is try to use a, cons a preparation over the counter that has a significant high level of EPA, one to two grams. Let's talk a little bit about red yeast rice. So red yeast rice is made by fermenting fungi from the genus Monascus on red rice. When you do that, you create some compounds that are called monacolines. And one of these compounds, monacoline K, is chemically very similar to lovastatin. Lovastatin was the first statin that was developed for lowering cholesterol. So in essence, taking red yeast rice is like taking a low dose of a statin. However, monac monacoline K and lovastatin do have some differences in bio bioavailability which may be of some importance when we talk about um, side effects. So it's been shown that red yeast rice lowers cholesterol, especially LDL. And if you review a lot of studies, in this case uh, about 20 studies were reviewed in a recent publication with um, RGR containing from 4.8 milligrams to 24 milligrams of monacoline K, uh, there was definite a reduction in LDL as an average 39 milligrams of reduction per deciliter compared to placebo. So again, it's almost like taking a low dose statin. The higher amount of monacoline K, the greater the reduction. So as you know, if you increase the dose, you get more reduction, which is similar to what happens when we are using statins. Best results are around, when taking around 10 milligrams of monacoline K. Regis rice also improves endothelial functions in humans. The endothelium is the lining of the arteries in the body. And as you will hear soon from Dr. Cook, uh, we are as young as our endothelium. So it's a very important part of our body. And uh, Regis rice have been shown to improve the function of the endothelium. When combined with statins, you can get even further lowering of LDL. And in one Chinese trial, there was a reduction in events. So, this slide here shows, summarizes the benefits of Regis rice. Uh, total LDL is uh, reduced. Again, a dose response. Apolipoprotein B is a component of LDL, is also reduced. Triglycerides, there's a mild reduction. HDL-C, there's a mild increase. And then measurements of uh, endothelial function, um, such as flow-mediated dilation, pulse wave velocity, there is a mild in, uh, improvement in these parameters. And in that one Chinese trial with over 1,400 patients post-MI, they have already had a heart attack, ages 65 to 75, this was reduced by 32% and need for bypass or stents by 49% when they were randomized to a uh, high dose of Regis rice. So those are the good news. There's some sobering news. Thanks to the deregulated supplement industry, the quantity of monacoline K in commercial RGR products vary wildly, from small amounts to well over recommended doses. And there's no way for physicians or consumers to know because they are not properly listed. It in a study in 2017 of 26 supplements sold in the U.S., there was a 124 variation range in monacoline K content per manufacturer's recommended daily servings. Now, why is it that you don't get a clear indication in the label of how much monacoline K? Very simply, the FDA considers any red yeast rice product with more than just a trace level of monacoline K to be considered an unapproved new drug. So technically, it's illegal to sell RGR supplements that contain high amounts of monacoline K. Now, because the industry is not regulated, not much is done with this, as long as you don't put in the bottle how much monacoline K you have. So that is why today, it's a little bit of a gambling when you buy in these products because you don't know exactly how much of the compound you are consuming. 
in the clinical trials, of course, they, they had a very specific amount that they knew they were giving the patients. But in real life, when we go to the uh, drugstore or the health stores to buy these things, we don't know exactly how much. So that's kind of um, where we are. Uh, I know that there are some moves by industries trying to see if they can come to some consensus because uh, there is an overall interest in using uh, these uh, compounds uh, to supplement as a supplement for patients and also to help people who already are taking a statin further reduce their NDL. And I'd like to now um, ask Dr. Cook to tell us a little bit about ni nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Mike. I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, a, supp a supplement that can improve vascular health, uh, NO supplements, nitric oxide supplements. I'll talk about that. But basically what, what these are are um, they're supplements that contain nitrate, which is yep. NO3. Raise that a little bit higher up. Can you see that at home? Here we go. Um, this is nitrate. That's the chemical formula for nitrate, NO3, or nitrite, NO2. And the body can convert those to nitric oxide. And I'm going to tell you why that's important. Um, the diagram that's shown uh, looks, uh, is looking at a microscopic view of a fairly normal looking vessel. Um, vessels, Mike, they have, a, as you know, a trilaminar structure, three, three parts. They have um, the advent tissue, which is the outside of the blood vessel. And they have the media, which is the muscle coat. And then they have a lining. Uh, it's like the Teflon coat of the blood vessel, the endothelium, which you mentioned earlier. And um, that endothelium is just one cell layer thick. It's a diaphanous film of tissue. You can't see it with the naked eye, but it has tremendous control over your blood vessel because it releases substances that relax the blood vessel, that prevents things from sticking, uh, that prevents the buildup that causes atherosclerosis. So. Um, uh, the endothelium is shown in this view is it, it right uh, in the area of the vessel where it's meeting the blood. The blood's flowing through the vessel and uh, the endothelium is what's uh, observed first. Now uh, this next picture, you're looking down on the endothelium and you can see these individual cells that compose this film of tissue uh, that uh, has such a, an important effect in the blood vessel. And as you, you mentioned, Mike, you are only as old as your endothelium. I, I think this really is true. If you, if you maintain the endothelium, you're not going to get vascular disease. You're not going to end up in the cath lab uh, if you maintain a healthy endothelium. Um, as I said, it maintains vascular homeostasis. That, that's a word that means a vascular health. Um, let me go on to the next slide here. One of the things that the endothelium is producing it's a variable factory. It's producing all kinds of agents, but one of the most potent agents is something called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a simple molecule, NO, uh, but it has complex effects on the blood vessel. Uh, it relaxes the blood vessel. Uh, it uh, prevents things from sticking, like platelets that can cause a blood clot, or white blood cells that can cause an inflammation. Um, and uh, it allows the blood to flow smoothly through the vessel. We've shown that if you can improve nitric oxide production, we and others have shown that you can prevent atherosclerosis, at least in animal models, and there's good evidence in people that if you have a healthy endothelium, uh, you're not gonna have major adverse cardiovascular events like you were talking about heart attack and stroke, um, vascular death. So a healthy endothelium is really important to have a healthy cardiovascular system. Now, um, what can you do to improve the health of your endothelium, this Teflon lining? There's a lot, actually, that you can do. Shown in this picture are some of the things that impair um, the endothelial function. Uh, up in the right-hand corner there uh, at uh, 1 o'clock is a cigarette. So <laughs> cigarettes uh, are known to impair um, endothelial health. Um, diabetes is another factor, uh, blood sugar, high blood sugar can impair. Um, turns out that there at 5 o'clock you can see that there are gender differences in endothelial function. Women tend to have better endothelial function than men. And um, the, uh, you see with uh, age uh, that endothelial function deteriorates. With sedentary state, you see a person sitting in a chair there, <laughs> the more exercise you get, the, the better your endothelium is. 
and high blood pressure can also contribute to impaired endothelial health. So, uh, and then finally, uh, diet uh, is something that we can do something about. I'll talk about that in a minute. Genetics um, can't modify that. But uh, there are some things that we can modify as shown on that slide. There's some drugs, which you mentioned already, uh, Mike. Statins, for example, have been shown to improve endothelial health. Our angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, metformin. So these are really good drugs. They are known to improve vascular health. They're known to reduce cardiovascular events. They improve endothelial function. They improve the release of nitric oxide from the vessel wall. So too does stopping smoking, tobacco <laughs> cessation. A Mediterranean diet has been shown to improve endothelial function and reduce cardiovascular events. And then, of course, I mentioned exercise also has a, an effect to improve your endothelial function. What can you do uh, about your diet to improve endothelial function? So there are a number of vegetables that are high in nitrites and nitrates. Turns out that those are good. Dietary nitrites and nitrates are actually good for you. Um, they are found in leafy green vegetables, primarily in beets. Beets are a rich source of nitrites. In fact, there's evidence that beet juice can lower your blood pressure, and it does so by increasing nitric oxide production. So there's some nice clinical trials showing that beet juice uh, can do have that benefit. Um, if you don't like beet juice, there are supplements, nitrite and nitrate supplements that uh, one can use. Uh, nitric oxide uh, supplements. So uh, one that I recommend, and in full disclosure, I'm uh, I have a scientific advisory board for human. Uh, they make a nice uh, nitrite supplement called Neo40 uh, that is well controlled uh, and uh, with good quality control. I think that's important because, as you mentioned, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the health food supplements yeah. that are out there. So nitrate, and nitrate in the diet is one way to do it. Um, leafy green vegetables and beets uh, supplements are also available. So I've never liked beets. I'm going to have to start learning how to eat them then. My <laughs> wife loves them, but I, I never like them. Uh -huh. um, so if you're going to use a supplement, is there a particular dose? When you look at the bottle, should they be looking for a particular amount of uh, content in the pill that you're going to take? or? Yeah, well, the, the, um, the uh, Neo40 uh, and the other supplements in the range of 20 to 40 uh, milligrams, milligrams is what people use. So. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to take the liberty that we have Dr. Cook here to introduce a little extra topic, which is not really supplement, but I think it's such an important topic that I want to also have his expertise here today because from an educational point of view, it's very important. Um, there's a lot of use of PPIs, drugs such as omeprazole, um, Pravacid, that are used to control hyperacidity and heartburns. And now they are over the counter and people use them. I personally use them for several years myself. And um, Dr. Cook has been one of the pioneers that made some very important observations about potential risk of these medications. So I'd like, John, for you to tell us a little bit about that and, and use this mm -hmm. moment to educate uh, physicians and, mm -hmm. and lay public on this. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Mike. Uh, the, um, these are great drugs, the proton pump inhibitors for gastric reflux. Um, when you use them as directed, they, they've been uh, approved for use for short periods of time, for two to four weeks. And they can be reused two or three times a year. The problem comes when you use them chronically. Like I did. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're over the counter, just like the supplements. Yeah. So I think we do, we do need more information about over the counter drugs, just as we need more information about over the counter supplements. I do think that we are overusing the proton pump inhibitors. Uh, the data that we have suggests that long term use of these agents can impair vascular health, can actually accelerate vascular aging. So, um, my recommendation is to, if you need the PPI, if your doctor recommends it, of course, take it. Uh, but talk over with your doctor whether or not you can get off of it. There are ways to get off of it. There are other drugs that, want, that can be used that we have shown are safer. In a study we did at Stanford, we showed that the long-term use of proton pump inhibitors were associated with the risk of heart attack. Um, whereas the other antacids, um, H2 antagonists, 
It's another type of antacid. Those were not. Those were not associated with heart attack. So um, they can be used. They're not as strong, and you might need to take a neutralizing antacid, Rolaids or Tums or something you know, uh, that uh, neutralizes the acidity with the H2 antagonist to get off of the proton pump inhibitor. Um, by the way, just parenthetically, they're hard to get off. Of. I, 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 how did you do it? I was going to say, it's very tough. I tell my patients, the stomach becomes addicted because they work so well. It took me a year. Mm -hmm. I had to start very slowly going from every day to three or four times a week and then alternating with the other medications and then to twice a week. I mean, it was a very slow process. Uh, today, I'm free. I'm not addicted anymore, but it's slow. Uh, and because very quickly you get a rebound of hyperacidity and you feel really bad. So um, I, when I talk to patients now, I, I take them through a protocol that and, and say, have patience because it's going to take you a while. It's yeah. not easy. Yeah, that rebound that you talked about, I, I, it's, it's a real thing. You know, at least half, patient, half the patients that are on PPIs will, if they stop that PPI, they'll have a rebound acidity. And what I recommend them to do is to take the, start taking the H2 antagonist yeah. a few days before they plan on exactly. stopping the PPI, yeah. and then carry some Rolaids or Tums in their pocket also, just in case they need it. Yeah. yeah. So we have uh, close to 16, 17 minutes for question and answers, so please feel free to text uh, your questions. I think we may have some questions already, and seeing one here, what are the risks or side effects of these uh, fatty acid supplements? So um, they're really not too much. Um, they're mostly minor side effects such as uh, bloating of the stomach. Some people can have a little bit of uh, loose stools. Um, so it's mostly gastrointestinal. Now, if you're taking very high, if you start going you know, into the three uh, grams a day and so on, very high amount, you could get a little bit of increased uh, bleeding. Some people can have a little bit of, of increased uh, uh, bleeding with it. Um, you also may get a fishy taste in your mouth. So most of the side effects are minor nuisances. Uh, big side effects tend to be um, more related to very high doses. Dr. Reisner, is CoQ10 effective in treating nocturnal leg cramps that are not related to a static use? Definitely, I think they are effective if the leg cramps, particularly nocturnal, are in the patient who's on the statin. In patients who are not on statin, that's a disease entity that we're very unfamiliar with, but it's not a very uncommon entity. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no data or evidence that, uh, that uh, CoQ10 is effective in that group of non-statin taking individuals. So oh, darn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Dr. Cook, what's the best time to take uh, nitrates in relation to exercise or time of the day? Does it That's matters? an interesting question. The, um, you know, there are, there, are some, there are some data that suggests that uh, nitrate supplements can improve exercise performance. So, um, you know, if, that you could potentially take them before you go out for a run or you know, a race or something like that. Um, huh. there, there's anecdotal evidence that they could be useful for sleep also. Um, when not to take them, if you're on a blood pressure lowering medicine, if you're already taking something to lower your blood pressure, these agents could drop your blood pressure even further and you could feel lightheaded, uh, for example. Um, if you're taking um, Viagra, you know, um, if you're using something for erectile dysfunction, uh, it's not recommended that you use these agents along with that because you could 
Uh, it also, again, it could drop your blood pressure. So we do have a lot of patients with high blood pressure mm -hmm. that potentially could benefit from these uh, supplements. So would you advise like a time separation from the t time they take their blood pressure medicine to maybe the time they take their once a day supplement? I, I would definitely advise them to talk to their doctor about it because th these these agents have an effect. They, they do lower the blood pressure. That's a good thing. Yeah, um, you may be able to lower the dose of the uh, medication you, that you're You giving. might be, and, yeah. and I've had, I've actually had people tell me that they've been able to go off of their blood pressure medication when they were taking these agents, but they're also improving their diet and there's other things going on. So it's, I think you have to talk to your doctor about it and um, with the recognition that these, these agents really do have an effect. They lower your blood pressure. John, I have a question that I'm sure uh, uh, has occurred to people listening and that is cardiologists use nitrates. Mm -hmm. Isosorbide dinitrate, yeah. isosorbide mononitrate. Mm -hmm. These are ubiquitous in cardiology. Are these drugs of any effect in the concept of enhancing endothelial function? Uh, that's a great question. And there, there, in fact, there is some evidence that uh, short term you can get an improvement with, with uh, nitroglycerin, for example, in endothelial function. But long term, nitroglycerin tolerance. The, the, the nitroglycerin tolerance that we, we, we've, we're familiar with from taking nitrates uh, for long periods of time, um, that's in part mediated by endothelial dysfunction mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if you're giving these exogenous uh, NO releasing drugs, it can have an adverse effect on the endothelium. So um, ba I, I basically, when, I, when I'm recommending nitrates for my patients, nitroglycerin for example, I have them take it to relieve symptoms but I don't generally prescribe it long-term, chronically. What do, you, what, what do you think about that? Well, as in, in patients with anginal symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, we use isosorbide dinitrate, isosorbide mononitrate. Never occurred to me that these may have some benefit on endothelial function per se, mm -hmm. but after listening to your presentation, I'm wondering, it is a nitrate. Yeah, yeah. Technically, a nitrate should offer yeah some benefit yeah. to the endothelium in addition to the effects that we know the nitrates have in reducing anginal symptoms. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We have a question here that probably it's uh, in a lot of ca cardiologists' minds, including my own. Uh, Al, do um, you have any words of wisdom for a sort of a, a way to manage patients uh, that you think have uh, SAMS. Uh, this is very, very common. So well, it is common, it? and I'm not sure I have words of wisdom, <laughs> but I can tell you one approach that you might use. Um, number one, di you have to diagnose SAMS correctly, and that's pretty difficult. Um, the typical thing would be the symptoms go away when you stop the statin, uh, typically it will reoccur when you restart either that or a different statin. How long a holiday would you give? You usually we'll give usually three to four weeks and oh, that by, that, by that time you should have either resolution or at least a, a major ben improvement in the symptoms. Hmm. It's interesting Mike that in studies of uh, CoQ10 versus placebo, that there was a substantial percentage of patients on placebo who developed the same symptoms of mm -hmm. SAMS. So it's a very gray area. area. Yep. But then if one is fairly convinced that this patient truly has SAMS, then we would start a CoQ10, typically uh, ubiquinol, and a dose of at least 200 milligrams, preferably 200 to f milligrams twice a day, or 400 milligrams. Uh, often we'll start it s several days or weeks before restarting the statin. And then uh, another trick that I sometimes have used is to restart the statin at a much reduced dose, three days a week, lower uh, dose per, per pill. And uh, I think a fairly high percentage of patients can be then carried on the, uh, the statin, which we know is so beneficial. So here's the kicker. There has been some studies um, and some observations that have suggested that 
sudden stopping of statins can give you a little spike in incidence of events. Um, in fact, I was just talking to a friend of mine earlier today who was going through one of these holidays periods because he was having the same problem, and during the holiday he had a heart attack. Hmm. And there are anecdotes like that. You know, uh, people, they, they've been studied that have shown that if you're going to have major surgery, don't stop your statin. You know. So is there a well-recognized risk, or is this just casual events that are coincidental, or is there a potential risk of, uh, of suddenly discontinuing statins in somebody who is a high-risk patient, you know? And I'm not talking about general, you know, the kind of patient that you really worry about that. Right. No, it's a, it's a well-observed phenomenon that there is a spike in cardiac events when somebody stops a statin. The question is the timing of right. the event. And I think within the first month, the likelihood of that is small. But there's no question that if one follows patients who suddenly stop the statins, that there is a higher incidence of yeah. acute cardiac kind of the, events. The situation we all have. Mm -hmm. So we have any, any other questions? Uh, hmm? Yeah, but I don't see any questions. Oh. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> all right, let's see what else we have here. Ah, okay. Uh, I have to manage that one. Is there any benefit in combining red yeast rice with other supplements? That's a biggie. Um, as I told you at the beginning, we chose a few supplements because they're the ones that are most commonly used. However, there's a lot of other stuff out there for people to use. Uh, there are plant sterols, um, citrus bergamot, soybean proteins, soluble fibers, like taking high dose of metamucil, for example, uh, and many others, antioxidants. So if you make a cocktail and mix them up, do you get more, better results? So actually, this is such an important topic that, and I was expecting this uh, question, so I, was, uh, I actually prepared for it, because it's such an important topic that there was a whole article written on it. And for the physicians in the audience, I would uh, refer you to um, the role of nutraceuticals in statin resistant patients. That was the specific uh, use uh, of the article, state of the art review. And it was, it was done by International Lipid Expert Panel Position Paper. So, I mean, they, they really, it's a beautiful paper, and they talk a lot about can these nutrients be used in statin resistant patients, uh, and so on. So. The bottom line is that there are conflicting results, but there are probably more positive than negative data to suggest that some of these supplements, such as the uh, phytosterols, the uh, citrus bergamot, uh, the berberine, or soybean, uh, or fibers, the ones I mentioned earlier, if combined with something like Reggie's rice, could give you a further reduction in cholesterol. Now, the question is, do you get better bangs for your bucks in terms of reduction in events? That's more difficult because still there has not been properly done uh, randomized trials, or the studies have been kind of small. Um, so the short answer is um, most of these other supplements don't produce too many side effects or harm. Um, they can be mixed. And there is some expert consensus to suggest that if you have a patient that cannot take a statin, you've tried everything, they cannot take a statin. And they cannot afford some of the newer agents that are $14,000 a year. So their options might be to combine taking perhaps some um, of the um, resins, like Wellcol, combined with some acetamide, and then put in Reggie's rice, throw in the fish oils, I mean, make a cocktail of all these things, and uh, together that may give you a reduction in um, cholesterol and triglycerides that you might not get um, otherwise. Of course, always with the advice of good nutrition and, and good diet. The reason um, that question is so hard to answer. But it's a very hard question to answer because, yeah, go ahead. We don't have the data. We don't have the data. Yeah. We don't have the data. Yeah, yeah. So there's yeah, yeah. there's very exactly few. Right. 
there's very few studies that have, have tried to look at combinations, particularly in large numbers of patients, and I don't know of any that have looked at major adverse cardiovascular events. Exactly. Um, yeah. So they, they, their, their end point is usually just a blood test. Right. Right. A blood test. But, you know, but that doesn't mean that you're going to That doesn't mean, that, over, that, doesn't mean that you're going to get a reduction in exactly. cardiovascular events. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. the other other problem with uh, the large uh, supplement trials, Mike uh, and Al, I don't know what how, what you think about this, but there's good evidence of heterogeneity yeah. in the supplements that are out on the market. That's the biggest problem. We don't have the same kind of quality control of supplements that we have uh, of drugs. Yep. And uh, some trials that have failed, you know, I wonder, you know, what the quality was of you know for the of the fish oil, for example, in in some of the trials that right. you mentioned earlier on that there was some. Uh, negative trials, or maybe it was Al that mentioned it, but uh, the, but uh, may have a, had a lot to do with the fact that some of these supplements that were used in those trials they weren't pharmaceutical grade, like the more recent trial of Acepta. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, in the trials, they because they're trials, they they try the best to have a more clear cut dose of these supplements um, because they can prepare them for the trial. When you go to the consumer store and buy them and then you know clearly there's a real problem with uh, heterogeneity like like you mentioned and, and with the dietary supplements it's buyer beware buyer beware mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, the uh, company that makes the product is not supposed to propose a health benefit to the product but that does not keep the internet from lauding the praises of one item or another item. item and that tends to be absorbed and believed by most people mm -hmm. so since i'm as old as my endothelium mm -hmm. so you say mm -hmm. um we have a question from the audience is there a little uh, simple tool i can use at home to measure my endothelial health well i don't know if you can use it <laughs> at home but there there are simple tools now to look at endothelial function you actually pointing to your finger <laughs> and uh, you probably know that there's uh, things like the endopat for example that that measure the pulse waveform in the finger so um, there are vessels in the finger the digital arteries and as your heart is pushing blood through them they they expand and uh, they expand a little bit more if their endothelium is healthy. So you can d t d look at uh, the pulse waveform uh, with uh, a, a device that uh, is made to measure those changes in the volume of your finger as the pulse wave but is going through it. This would be a test that the doctor would do with the patient, not something that they would go and buy. This is generally something you come into a clinic into for. A clinic right. yeah, that, 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 but you know, I'm, I, I would be surprised if we don't have something that's already out there that you can actually you know, measure really your pulse. In fact, there are devices that measure the pulse waveform, right? Uh, it's fascinating that, you know, listening to you and, and truly listening to how important endothelial function is, it's amazing that we as cardiologists, we really don't do much of that testing at all. Hmm. And it sounds like maybe this is something that should become more available on day-to-day -day care. Yeah, I think so. The uh, pulse waveform actually is much more sensitive in terms of it's, uh, the, the vas it's more sensitive to vascular disease than is blood pressure, hmm. for example. You know, people have a, an alteration in their pulse waveform long before they get an elevation of their blood pressure. So in terms of trying to understand the health of the vasculature, blood pressure is kind of a crude tool. Uh, pulse waveform is much better. Uh, Very interesting. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Reisner, uh, how does curcu curcumin help prevent heart disease? We didn't talk about curcumin. Uh, what the heck is that? Well, <laughs> I can tell you this, I'm not an expert on curcumin uh, in heart disease, so I can't answer that question, but I will make a, a, a comment that, that has fascinated me throughout my career, and that is that I will see patients who I say, you have a high cholesterol, you have a high risk of coronary artery disease, you need to be on a statin. And they'll say, doctor, I hate taking drugs. And you look at the list of things they're taking, it may be curcumin, <laughs> a list of 20, 20 uh, items. All Spending of a fortune. One, <laughs> all of which in one way or another are a drug, not approved, not proven, yeah. Yeah. but nonetheless a drug. And the interaction of these things is something that hasn't been studied, yeah. 
but I believe can be a very potent uh, adverse effect sure. of the mega pharmacy that mm -hmm. we, uh, the world that we now live right. in. Well, you can get it as a supplement, right, curcumin, and it is, but it is a spice, right? It's a spice that's used, yeah. it's an antioxidant. It's an antioxidant. And uh, so it's maybe useful. The same as garlic, for example. Right. Uh, well, time flies while we're having fun, and the hour has uh, concluded. So um, I want to first thank my uh, two participants, Dr. Cook, Dr. Reisner, as always, your superstars. And I want to thank all of you for listening. This is going to stay permanently in our file of educational activities. So if you didn't have a chance to listen to it today, you can always come back to our educational channels in YouTube and watch it. Good evening. Mm -hmm.